on, everybody, and welcome back to the Hangout Spot, where you already know it's Real Talk Sports Talk, live from my man, Cave. It's your boy, Johnny, and let's talk Jets. But before we do that, I just want to wish one of my subscribers and a huge supporter a very happy birthday, my buddy, Stephen Action Jackson. Today's his birthday. Happy born day, my friend. Hope you are having a great day. Thank you for always watching and having my back. And now let's get into it. Because I'm about to drop my 2023 New York Jets season report card where I'm going to grade each unit. I'm going to grade the coaching staff. I'm going to grade the GM. And then I'm going to grade the entire team as a whole based on how they performed this year. And I'm going to try to do that without being animated and using any curse words. So wish me luck. Because <laughs> this season was rough. Another 7-10 and 10 season, carbon copy of last year, started with a lot of promise. That ended really quick, four plays in. But realistically, even though the expectations changed, it should have never been this bad. No way on earth it should have been this bad. This team did have talent. They could have been a lot better. And there's no reason why they're not playing this weekend coming up, wild card weekend. But here we are. So let's start with the bad. Let's start with the offense. Because when I say bad, <laughs> I mean, that's being kind. This offense was horrendous. It's one of the worst offenses that I've seen in recent history. And let's look at the numbers. The Jets were 29th in average points per game. They were 30th in average yards per game. They were 30th in average passing yards per game. They were 22nd in average rushing yards per game. And they were dead last, 32nd, in third down efficiency, converting only 26% of their third downs, which is probably the worst in the last 50 years. Yeah, all of that, we did that. And it was painful just to say it. Imagine watching it in real time. And that's what we all had to endure. But there was some good, so let's talk about the good before we get into the ugly. Brees Hall was a bright spot. Make no mistake, DeMar Hamlin, he should be, rightfully so, the comeback player of the year. But Brees Hall, he's definitely the Jets' comeback player of the year. Coming back from an ACL injury, and this guy looked like he didn't skip a beat. Picked up right where he left off against Buffalo that first game. Big run. First time he touched the, fall, uh, the football, he had another big run. Later on in that game. He had big runs periodically all season. He is a home run hitter. He's electrifying. Dual threat. Six yards shy of a 1,000-yard season, which is impressive, especially behind a piss-poor offensive line. Averaged four-point yards a carry. He had five touchdowns on the ground. The passing game, he was even better. 76 catches for 591 yards and four touchdowns. And again, this is with poor play calling. Over 1,500 yards of total offense, both in the air and on the ground. He is a weapon and a keeper. Garrett Wilson, another great season in my opinion. He'll tell you it was his worst of his career, but this guy has had seven quarterbacks in two years. And still he managed his second straight 1,000-yard season. Super impressive. 95 catches, three touchdowns. That was kind of low, obviously. The Jets got to do whatever it takes to keep him on this team. Get him some help on the other side. God only knows what kind of numbers he can put up with a good, capable quarterback. We'll see. We got Rodgers coming back next year, so we'll see. Tyler Compton, I thought he was good this year. And I wasn't high on him coming into the season because the year prior, he dropped a lot of passes, fumbled a couple of times in key situations. So I was kind of... Mm, so so on him but he had a good season he was solid I mean 61 catches 621 yards he didn't have a touchdown but for the most part you know he had some good chemistry like Zach Wilson was really comfortable with him especially over the middle countless passes over the middle to move the chains so he was good I think Joe Tipman was also good as well the rookie center that Douglas drafted he showed some flashes but now let's talk about the bad and the ugly. And let's start with the guys up front, the offensive line. 
the offensive line is probably the worst offensive line performance in a season that I've ever seen watching football. It was demoralizing. And I know that they got decimated with injuries. They had a ton of injuries, but it didn't matter who they plugged in or what lineup they put out there. They were just horrendous, man. A lot of that has to do, in my opinion, with, with coaching. And we'll get into that when we start talking about the coaches specifically. But this unit gave up 64 sacks. That's almost four sacks a game. And one of those sacks came four plays into the season. And we already know what happened there. Quarterback play wasn't good. This is the second year in a row that we're saying this. Three quarterbacks that we had, they combined for just 11 touchdown passes and 15 interceptions. Trevor Simeon was our best starter as far as win-loss record. He was 2-1 down the stretch. Tim Boyle lost his only start on Black Friday. And trust me when I tell you, it was, it was, it was pretty dark, pretty black. Zach Wilson was 5-8 and eight as a starter. And you got to think that, again, we're never going to see Zach Wilson again in the Jets uniform. North Trevor Simeon. Tim Boyle was cut already. So next season we'll have Aaron Rodgers. And it'll be interesting to see who they bring in as the backup. Penalties. Penalties was a team problem. But the reason why I put it on the, under the offense is because the pre-snap penalties this year were killers. How many times did we have a chunk play, a first down, in one case, a touchdown call back because of a stupid pre-snap penalty. Holdings, false starts, illegal formations, illegal shifts. For God's sakes, we even saw a bunch of delay of games. That's unacceptable. That's just a severe lack of concentration and a lack of accountability from the coaches or from the head coach, Robert Sala. And it never got better. And obviously the play calling was atrocious. And that's being kind. No creativity. Nothing. There were games where we couldn't even score a touchdown. Consecutive games. It was bad. The offense gets an emphatic and bold F. Which takes us now to the defense. Defense was solid. I think this defense is very good. I don't think they're a great defense yet. And there's a reason why I'm saying that. We'll get into that in a second. But very good, that's not too shabby. One of the better defenses in the league, in my opinion. They were seventh in average points, uh, average yards allowed, I'm sorry. They were 12th in average points allowed. They were 12th in sacks with 46. They were eighth in interceptions with 17. So they were good. They were good. And in some games, they were dominant. The good on the defense, to me, it starts with our team MVP, Quincy Williams. He had himself an amazing season. And he just announced he's a first-team All-Pro. Congratulations. Well-deserved. 17 games. He had 95 tackles, two sacks, 10 passes defended, two forced fumbles. But the best part about Quincy Williams is almost in every tackle, every big play, you're going to see him there. He is all over the field. He's a spark plug. He's fast. He's aggressive. He's a tackling machine. And he complements C.J. Mosley very, very well. A mainstay on this defense. And his brother Quinnen isn't too shabby either. That's another good part of this defense. Another all-pro season. Five and a half sacks. His first interception of the year and of his career came this year, and he had two forced fumbles. But again, his impact is that regardless, and, and we're talking about a guy who constantly gets double teamed, he's consistently in the backfield wreaking havoc. And that, to me, pressures is just as important as sacks. Another great season for Quinnen. The safeties were good. Jordan Whitehead, I mentioned they had 17 interceptions. He had four of them. Three, the first game of the season against the Bills. Tony Adams was good. He had three picks. Ashton Davis was good. He had himself a solid season, too. He had three picks as well. The secondary was good. Sauce Gardner is, in my opinion, another Duero Rivas. He is a shutdown corner. All pro. Pro bowler. Second year in a row. First team. They just, they just don't throw the ball in his direction. That's why he doesn't get a lot of interceptions. And the front four. They're legit. 
in my opinion, the best front four in football. You get pressure on the quarterback, and the Jets don't even need to blitz because they're that good. And they shift a lot of guys in and out to keep them fresh. The bad, and this is why I tell you that I wouldn't call them great just yet. They have five losses, five games where the Jets defense gave up 30 or more points. And that, to me, that doesn't happen when your defense is great. You may have a game, maybe two, where you have a low five games. That, to me, is way too much. And there was another game against the Commanders where they gave up 28 points. And there were some games, and I know that there were some games that they were out there for a long period of time because the offense was inept, kept punting the football, defense was out there, more than likely got tired in the second half of the game. But I also think that there was a couple games where they kind of quit in the second half too. Great defenses, that never happens. Even though I said penalties was an offensive problem, it's defense did have some penalties too. But I won't really knock them for that. That'd be nitpicking. A lot of their penalties, I mean, they're an aggressive, fast defense. Those things are going to happen. But way too many roughing the passers. So they got to cut down on that. Those were killers. There were a couple of games where they could have gotten, you know, off the field. But that penalty kept the other team's office on the field. And then the turnovers. They did get some turnovers, and again, this may seem like it, I'm nitpicking, but again, the great defenses, they take advantage of every turnover opportunity. It's rare that they let one go by. The Jets dropped way too many interceptions this year. C.J. Mosley, Mosley dropped a few. Jordan Whitehead, I believe, dropped one. There were a couple of other corners that dropped a couple. they got to start taking more advantage of these turnover opportunities. That's what the great defenses do. Fumbles as well. There were plenty of times that the other team put it on the ground, whether we caused it or not, and we failed to fall on it. Those are fundamentals. And again, those are big plays. Those are plays that we could have potentially gotten the ball back for the offense in good field position. We got to take advantage of those. And again, this is why I'm saying that they're not there yet as far as great. They're very good, and that's not a knock. I mean, they are a top defense. They're just not great yet, but they're well on their way there. I like what... Ulbrich is doing with this defense, I will give them a solid B. Special teams, which I think is the most consistent unit on the team, led by Brent Boyer. I think he is a really good coach, probably one of our better coaches who really doesn't get a lot of recognition. And we'll talk about that in a second when we talk about the coaches. But our field goal, our kicking game, was one of the best in the league in my position, uh, in my um, in my opinion, we hit, we kicked 36 field goals out of 39 tries. We only missed three field goals on the season. We only missed one extra point. We were 16 out of 17. Greg Zerline, Greg DeLeg, Legatron, whatever you want to call it, he's legit. Our best field goal kicker in, in the past 10, 15 years. He went 35 of 38, almost 93%. His longest was 55 yards, but trust me, there were a few that he hit from 50. That if there were no net, they would have probably went 65, 66, 67 yards. His leg, you better check it for steroids. <laughs> and he only missed one extra point in the season. Again, this is a league where you see a lot of field goals being missed and a lot of extra points. So he was consistent. 120 total points on the year. So I'm sure he made a few fantasy, uh, fantasy football team owners happy. From, 40, from field goals of 40 to 49 yards, he only missed one. Most impressively, most impressively, he was five of six from field goals 50 yards and more. The Jets got to find a way to bring him back because he's a free agent. Thomas Morstead, who's probably another one of our honorable mentions for team MVPs. He was good, but it's never a good thing when your punter is being mentioned in that category. 17 games, he had 99 punts. That's a lot. That's almost six punts a game. He averaged almost 49 yards a punt. His longest was 62 yards. There were 36 punts that he got inside of the 20, and there were a countless bunch that he got inside of the five-yard line, which enabled the Jets to get a few safeties this year. He was good. He's another free agent they got to find a way to bring back. Kicking game, the punters, they're important. Justin Hardy is, is legit, you know, as a, as a gunner, as a tackler, especially on punt returns. And then when he was out, Irving Charles, the rookie, went in there admirable job. These guys are always the first ones down there to make a tackle on a punt return or a kick return. 
Xavier Gibson, our punter, uh, punt returner and kickoff returner, he had a solid rookie season. He had 33 punts, 9.7 yards averaged. 65 was his longest. He had one touchdown. I'm sure everybody remembers that. Week one against Buffalo, 9-11. Won the game in overtime. Huge moment for the kid. I kind of thought after that he'd probably get another one at some point in the season, maybe two more. But he only had that one. But he seems like he's getting better and better. And he will as he starts um, you know, playing more years and getting more confidence. As a kickoff returner, again, this is a hard stat to judge. Mostly every kick is kicked in the end zone. I don't know why the NFL even has kickoffs anymore. They should just put it on the 25. But he did return 22 of those for an average of 23.2 yards, as long as it was 34. What I can remember is he had one bad game with a fumble, possibly maybe two fumbles, but other than that, he rebounded well. And he was solid for the most part of the year, and I expect him to be even better next year with one year under his belt. This Again, this unit was the most consistent especially due to the fact that there's always a lot of moving parts in special teams. Brant Boyer does a good job in keeping it all together and making sure that these guys are motivated to follow this scheme. They're solid. They tackle well. It's rare that you say the special teams had a horrible game, and that's a good problem to have if you're Brant Boyer. I give this unit an A. Now coaching, and this is where I'll probably get a little bit more animated because this – this coaching staff has major opportunities, and it starts right up top. So let's get right to it. Let's talk about the head coach, Robert Sala, who I think is a good guy, and I think the players like him. I think he's one hell of a defensive coordinator. I just don't think he's a good coach at all. I mean, the record speaks for itself. Just not good. And there's a few reasons why. Let's talk about penalties. When you have a team that leads the league in penalties, what does that mean? That usually means that they're undisciplined, right? They're unfocused. They lack concentration. If it's happening week after week, they're not being held accountable, right? And that falls on the coach. I'm sure we could all agree on that, right? Well, guess what? I just described the Jets. That's right. We did that. That was us. So that falls on Robert Sala. The penalties were just horrendous. And it seemed like there was no accountability. Like, I'm waiting for him to get in a player's face and just jaw them out. Or maybe even pull a player and bench him for the entire game when he commits that stupid pre-snap penalty that takes away a big first down or a big chunk play. Never did it. That's why we continuously had that problem. And they'll sit there and tell you that they addressed it in practice every week, right? But whatever he was doing wasn't working. He's a, he's a guy that, that will get really animated when there's a good play that happens on defense, but then when bad plays happen, he's sitting there like Todd Bowles 2.0 with his arms crossed. Sometimes it's okay to show some fire when the things aren't going well. Get in a player's face. You might get them to react differently and play differently. And again, maybe that's not his demeanor or his personality, but that's one of the reasons why I don't think that he's cut out to coach in this type of market. Again, no in-game adjustments as well. It looks like this team constantly came in with a plan A, but no plan B or C. No halftime adjustments. There were games where it looked like we were unprepared. We weren't ready to play, especially the one against the Giants coming off a of bye week. That's on coaching, man. How many times at the half? We were well within striking distance to either take the lead or tie the game. Never considered pulling the quarterback to potentially put the back up to try to provide a spark in a winnable game. This is what good coaches are supposed to do, right? They're supposed to have a good feel for the game. And if the offense is inept and they aren't moving the football, there's no justification to go back out there in the second half and put them to play again. Try something different. You owe it to the team. You play to win that game. And you worry about next week when it happens. Probably tell you the reason why he didn't do that is because he had no confidence in Tim Boyle. That maybe you should have been in, in, in Joe Douglas' office saying, get me a backup quarterback, a veteran backup quarterback that can run this office that I can trust in the event that this kid isn't good, I can turn to this guy and give us a good chance to win. Show some cojones. And if you're Hispanic, you know exactly what that means. Challenges weren't really good. There were a bunch of challenges that we missed out on. And I know those are hit or miss, but then there was some that I'm like, why are we even challenging it? Like, really? And again, we'll go back to the cojones. On the fourth downs, 
Take some more chances. Take some more risks. Maybe look at what Dan Campbell is doing and Nick Sirianni are doing. These guys are going forward on fourth downs in the first quarter. And I'm not telling you you have to do that. But there were times in the season where we're like, dude, go for it. Crazy part about it is when we did go for it, we were actually good. We were good. We were better at for converting on fourth downs than we were on third downs. You would think he would do that more. There were games that we were losing in the fourth quarter by double digits late in the fourth quarter. And he was still punting the football instead of going for it. F for Robert Sala. Emphatic F. Offensive coordinator, if there was a letter grade lower than an F, he'd get that. So let's just assume that X was a grade. That's what Nathaniel Hackett gets. This guy is by far the worst offensive coordinator we've had in Jets history, which is, which is a hard feat to accomplish considering who we've had in the past, including his dad. But this guy is so bad, he makes his dad look like Sean McVay. Yeah. There's no type of creativity whatsoever. No motions, pitches, no sweeps. Very few end arounds. I mean, the offense for the most part is was rectangular offense, middle of the field, between the 20s, 10, 12 yards, slant passes. That's it. Check downs. How many times during the season did I scream, like, throw the ball vertically, throw the ball downfield? We had no single vertical threats. It's like he did not draw up any type of vertical plays downfield. At the very least, I was begging for him to at least throw it, try it. Maybe we get a pass interference. At least, at least the other team will have a sense that, yeah, you know what? They do have some sort of vertical passing game. We made it way too easy on the defense. How many times am I sitting there, or you as a fan, and we can call the play that's coming next? If we can do that and be, and be right 95% of the time, it's not a secret why we couldn't score or move the chains. The defense was on to us. My biggest question about Hackett is I can't understand the justification to bring him back. I mean, I know why we're bringing him back. Obviously, he was brought here to, to coach Aaron Rodgers, not to develop Zach Wilson. But at the end of the day, you can't justify bringing this guy back as bad as he was. But this is the Jets we're talking about. Terrible. Offensive line coach, horrible. I don't care that we were decimated by injuries. It was more than that to me. To me, it was a scheme problem. Technique, execution, regardless who was in there. Feels like there were guys that did play multiple weeks. Never looked like they got better. In fact, towards the end of part of the season, it looked like they gave up. Not only is this guy a bad offensive line coach, but players despise him. I mean, you saw Taylor Lewan's tweet. Other players said the same thing. For God's sakes, Mekhi Becton came, came out and, and doubled down on it and agreed with Taylor Lewan. Guys on our own team. How can you justify bringing a guy back to a staff where players on that side of the field hate him. And I know Mekhi Becton is probably not coming back, but if you could take anything away from Garrett Wilson's interview earlier this week, I'm pretty sure that he's unhappy with certain aspects, certain people on this coaching staff. I'm sure of it. You can tell by his answers and his demeanor and his body language. Read between the lines. Can't justify bringing this guy back. He is another X, a F. Woosa. <laughs> Obrick, defensive coordinator, he was solid. I like him. I think uh, he definitely got better this year, um, you know, from year one to two. I like his rotations on the D-line. It keeps them fresh. That way they are still wrecking havoc late in the games. So I do like that. He's able to create pressure up front without having to blitz. That's key. My biggest criticism with Albrecht, and again, this may be nitpicking a little bit, but sometimes he gets too set in his ways. For example, he'll put Sauce Gardner on one side of the field, and that's where he'll stay the entire game. And then he'll put DJ Reed over here, and that's where he'll stay the entire game. And regardless of what receivers they're going up against, he won't consider switching them around when you should. And the reason why is because Sauce Gardner is a special player. He is Darrell Revis 2.0. He's a shutdown corner who you can put on the other team's best receiver to try to take that threat away. And I know that he'd want to do that. I'm sure he'd be up for the challenge. Do that, man. Move him around the field. Don't get set in your ways. 
Remember that game against the Dolphins when Waddle was just torching DJ Reed? That would have been a game where I would have said, you know what, enough. Sauce, that's your guy. You are going to follow him the entire rest of this game, and you're going to shut him down, and he's not going to get another catch. Sauce is capable of that. Do that. So that's the only criticism I have against him. Again, you may think it's nitpicking, but he's got to be a little bit more diverse, especially you know, in-game, depending on what he's seeing. But other than that, I think he's solid. Like I said, I give him a B. And then the special teams coach, uh, Brad Boyer, again, I think the most special thing about him is there have been three coaches, our last three coaches, um, Bowles, Gase, and Sala. They all brought in their own offensive and defensive coordinators, but they kept Brad Boyer as their special teams coordinator, which tells me a lot about him and how he's perceived and how respected he is as a coach. And regardless, special teams is, is rough to coach because it's always a constant revolving door of players, young guys, older guys, guys trying to make the team. You got to get them to buy in, right? They got to do their job on special teams if they want to potentially get, you know, playing time on the offense and defense, right? And it's about his scheme. And it doesn't matter who you put in there, man. It works. They tackle well. They're disciplined. Now they're kicking well. For God's sakes, there were a couple of fake punts that he devised this year that were great, that worked. Thomas Morstead, remember that pass where he looked better than Zach Wilson that game? He did that. So I give him a lot of credit. I do. Um, I think he's a bright young coach, doesn't get a lot of, of uh, you know, media attention, a lot of credit. But I'd like to see one day maybe, hopefully he gets a, you know, at least an interview for a head coaching job. I think special team coordinators, in my opinion, can make really good head coaches. Because again, if you can communicate to different members of the team, whether they be on the offensive side or defensive side as a whole, that bodes well when you're communicating to a team. And again, it's rare that you say after a game that the special teams was horrendous and it was the reason why we lost. Maybe once in a blue moon, but again, for the most part, they're consistently good, and that's because of Brad Boyer, and I give him an A. Coaching staff in general, because of how bad Salah and the offensive staff is, they get an F. Sorry, Brad Boyer, and sorry, Albrecht. They get an F. It's just not good enough. And now the GM. Last but not least, the GM. Before the season started, I would have given him a B. He brought in Aaron Rodgers, finally got us that quarterback that we felt can take us to the promised land. At the time, I thought bringing Lazard in was a good move. Cobb, he's a veteran guy that had some rapport with Aaron Rodgers. I thought that they would fit in well with what we were trying to build. He drafted Tipman. I think Tipman's going to be a decent player. So again, coming into the season... I thought we had a good roster. I thought we had a roster that could definitely make the playoffs. And then once you get in, who knows? With our defense. But then once the season started, like he went on vacation and didn't come back until his press conference earlier this week. And that doesn't cut it. Because GM, your job is the entire season. You're not just judged on what you do in the offseason. You're, you're judged on what you do in season as well. And in my opinion... The great GMs separate themselves from the good GMs because of what they do in season because that's much more harder to pivot and adjust. Right? I mean, guy goes down in a key uh, position with injury. You get another guy, you plug him right in. If you can, you do the best you can to try to put a Band-Aid on it. You get a guy who's just not effective at a key position, you try to upgrade that guy and get a guy who's going to do better. And even if it's a position of strength, if you've got an opportunity to make that position even stronger, you go for it, especially if you're a playoff team. It'll solidify you going down the stretch, go you, get, you, get you into the playoffs. Those are the, good GM, those are the great GMs. And, those, and there's no secret why those GMs win Super Bowls because they're playing chess. They're not playing checkers like Joe Douglas is. And Salah, he's playing Connect Four. He's not even playing any of those games. Again, at the end of the day, he had an opportunity after the first game to get a veteran quarterback in. They preach, well, we wanted a redshirt Zach Wilson. The plan was from the sit all season behind Aaron Rodgers. We didn't want to play him. Well, hello, do you, know, do, do you not know how to redshirt a player? You get another guy to back up Aaron Rodgers and you make him the third stringer. That way he's not going to play. They didn't do that. You put all your eggs in one basket, you know, thinking Aaron Rodgers is going to play the entire season and Zach Wilson is going to sit behind him and it's going to work out well and we're going to the playoffs. And Did you not think that there was a possibility that Aaron Rodgers got hurt 
and you felt confident after two months, just two months of training camp and OTAs and preseason that, that Zach Wilson had soaked up all this knowledge in two months from Aaron Rodgers that he was going to automatically be fixed and be ready to rock and roll and quarterback a team that had playoff aspirations. You really thought that in two months he was going to be ready? Not good. Not good. And then he, then he addresses the quarterback position weeks later when the fans start complaining about it and he brings in Trevor Simeon, which again, these are moves that I believe that they made just to shut the fan base up. Your line was decimated the first half of the season. You add them in on keeping Zach as the quarterback. Great. So why don't you go out before the deadline and try to make some reinforcements? Not one move at the deadline to bring in any type of offensive line help on a team that needed it badly. When there were guys that were getting traded for six rounders. At this point, you just needed bodies in there. Then you pick up a guy from the street, Sappho, who's def who, who obviously wasn't in, in game shape, and you put him on the practice squad for weeks. He never makes it onto the field. You cut him. Why'd you even pick that guy up? Again, again, to shut the fan base up. That's not how you operate. That's not how you make moves to try to make a team better. This team, there's no reason why this team, just because they lost their starting quarterback with the talent that we had coming into the season, should not have been competing for a wild card spot in December. 7-10 and ten for the second year in a row, and this year with talent, that's unacceptable. In an AFC that was wide open, went down to the wire. Seven teams are now in the playoffs, not six, and we still can't find a way to get in there because we couldn't make those adjustments in season. We couldn't deal with adversity. Unacceptable. That's an F, if you ask me. And this offseason is going to be a... <laughs> Huge offseason for Joe Douglas because to me it's playoffs or bust. And they better all thank Joe Douglas, Sala, all these guys better thank Aaron Rodgers that they're all coming back because he's the sole reason why they're coming back. And if that's the case, then you better do what you need to do to put some pieces around him and get this ship steered in the right direction. Because again, the same nonsense that we saw this year, we can't see it next year because these guys will be out of a job. So this is a huge offseason. So all in all, 7 and 10, F, unacceptable. And those are my grades. And I'm happy that I was able to do that without getting worked up and without cursing. And again, those are my opinions of how the grades, of how this team should be judged and graded. I'm sure everybody's going to have their own opinion. I'd love to hear what everybody thinks in the comment section. But at the end of the day, regardless of the grades, I'm sure we'd all agree, we can't see this again. We can't. Things have to be different. This is going to be a huge offseason. A lot of holes that they need to plug. They had five picks. So again, I, I want to be optimistic, but it's going to be hard for me to believe that they're going to be able to plug in all these holes with just a limited amount of picks. It's, it's all going to depend on what they do in free agency as well. Plus, not to mention, we have our own free agents that we got to bring back. There's a few that I think need to come back. There's a bunch that need to go. But there's a few that I think could be vital pieces of this team going forward next year. So we'll see. We'll start talking about that type of stuff after the Super Bowl. We'll pivot. We'll start talking about some of the Jets free agents and some, some of the key free agents that are out there that we feel that they should get. We'll start talking about the draft as well. And then again, hopefully that'll take us right into training camp where we can start to get excited again. Realistically, I mean, all we have is optimism, right? We're in this together through the good and the bad. And we've gone through a lot of bad, but best believe when things start getting good, we're gonna go through that together as well. But, you know, with Rodgers coming back, you know, there's hope. But again, the offensive line needs to be addressed. This guy's gonna be 41 in December. Let's not forget that. We can't take the risk that he's not gonna be protected. We gotta protect this guy. We gotta get a second receiver, a good viable number two receiver that can complement Garrett. Backup quarterback, a veteran. Interesting offseason, to say the least. Anyhow, if you're new to watching my videos, hope you enjoy. Please subscribe. That way you can come back more often, hang out with your boy here in the Hangout Spot. This is how we do. Once you subscribe, you are family. Lots of cool stuff coming in 2024, so make sure you're coming along for the ride. And as always, I appreciate you watching. I appreciate your, appreciate your support. This is your boy, Johnny. 
signing out from the hangout spot, and I'll talk to everybody soon.